All right. Hi, everybody. And we are here with author Andrew O'Brien. How are you doing, Andrew? I'm fantastic, Leslie. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, so why don't we start by having you tell everyone who you are and what you write? Fair enough, then. My name is Andrew O'Brien. I write the Doug Andrews series currently. Uh, began this project back in the fall of 2021. Uh, saw as an opportunity to expose the world to a community that was in their midst, but was not very knowledgeable about and felt like they need their time to shine. In this particular case, it was the amateur radio or ham radio community. Uh, okay. where we're licensed by various governments and we're able to talk to various people all over the world using microphones, using computers, using Morse code paddles. Um, I felt it was an opportunity to give the world a picture of what ham radio was today in a fun and interesting kind of way. Uh, started that out, my first novel, Silence Key, and that was a particular focus to sort of show the world uh, really what we were about and uh, also to show that, you know, give some interest for people to say, maybe I want to check that out. Maybe at least see, or maybe not, but at least I know what's up with that. My grandpa always talked about ham radio. Now I have an idea of what that's about. Yeah. That that grew into at least two books now. Uh, the second book was Insider Threat, which I wrote about maybe, started writing it about a week after the first draft of the first novel. And that became another novel, which is going to be released in October that I'm currently in the process of recording the audio book. Nice. And uh, that's where we're at. Great, great. Yeah, that sounds like fun. So are you, um, are you published independently or with a, a publishing company? Uh, I am self-published, but okay. that was more just based on subject matter uh, because there's only about 700,000 licensed amateur radio personnel in the US. I figured it was going to be a little too much niche for traditional publishing, but I'm always open offers. Yeah, for sure. So what genre does it fall under? Is it a mystery or? Um, I would say that it sort of straddles between mystery and thriller. I think that's okay. a good way to describe these novels. Uh, yeah. Some lean more into the mystery aspect of it. Uh, it's more of a murder mystery and silence key. Uh, insider threat sort of leans more into the thrower aspects of it. And uh, the third novel uh, that will be released, Anders the Blood Axe, sort of straddles the two. Ah, gotcha. So because you are very familiar with um, things like microphones and recording and electronic devices, you ended up deciding to record your own audiobooks, right? That's correct, yes. So how did you go about doing that? Okay, um, I would first start with the motivation, like a lot of people, uh, it was definitely a new medium in terms of being able to expand your audience. Uh, we all know that one person that, you know, they like reading books, but they just don't have the time. They're an audio person, that's who they are. Gosh right. knows I was like that in several jobs where just listening to audio, audio books and audible over and over. Uh, so I started doing research and first saw that, you know, hiring a professional would cost at least 75 bucks an hour. So it was like, okay, that's kind of out. Right. So, so how do we do it on our own? Then I found, okay, you can do this on your laptop and you can use it various open source programs as well as a plugin for that program to be able to make sure that it passes the ACX audio test. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, if you'd like, I could go into that if that's okay. Yeah, sure, go for it. All right. Uh, so the program in question is called Audacity. And yes, right. that is the name of it. Uh, very <laughs> popular sound recording program. Uh, one of the key features that makes it amazing is it has uh, third-party plugins you can put into it. And one of them is referred to as ACX uh, Check. Uh, it doesn't necessarily come with Audacity, but you can install it and enable it. And once you're there, you can start to record your own audiobooks. So you can just plug in a headset, like I know where people are listening, but I'm wearing a uh, and headset with a microphone on. That's what I typically will use to record on the exact laptop that I use to record. Uh, so I will just, you know, hit record, read over a few passages from the book, hit stop, and then I'll select the audio file and do the uh, check on it to see if it'll pass the ACX tests. Because hmm. ACX is the gateway for basically you to get your books into iTunes and especially Audible. So right. that's kind of the 
key for all of that, but they have very, very particular audio standards. And all of this is automated, so it's there's not really anyone you could talk to in terms of getting this down correctly, but the plugin will give you an idea of how your audio can pass in terms of that testing. So once I had that plugin, you know, if you go into it, there's a menu called Analyze. If you drop down, it'll say ACX Check, probably three from the bottom. You'll uh -huh. have a pop-up window, and it'll give you the three criteria for what you need to pass. Your peak audio levels, your RMS normalization, as well as your uh, background noise. Now, uh, there's very defined ones, but typically I would use about negative 3.2 dB for uh, the peaks. That tends to be what consistently will pass. Uh, for RMS normalization, it's negative 20. And then for the background noise, typically you want to get it between maybe negative, eight, negative 80 to negative 65 seems to be the sweet spot. Um, the thing that's going to drive you crazy is the background noise. Because right. that low level, it's not even just what you can hear that can drive you crazy. It's the stuff like uh, a compressor that's so silent that just isn't even audible. But that can make it fail. Hmm. So uh, interesting. Uh, so that was kind of you know once I saw that this was available and that this tool was avail uh, was available ready to go, and it's like okay, it took me about a month to finally learn how to do that in terms of just getting used to oh man, I flunked the test. How do I make this pass? Or how do I right. fix the background noise? Or where's the ideal location? Um, and eventually I got to a point where the second book took about maybe six days of recording to basically get done. And may, it's a little bit longer for this third book just because I started a new job. So there's a little less time to work with. Uh, but it probably will be maybe two weeks, probably total. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Can I ask like roughly how long your books are lengthwise, word count wise? Um, I would say that lengthwise, I think I straddle around maybe first book was about 241 pages. Second book, I think ended up being about maybe 270, I want to say maybe close mm -hmm. to 300. Um, this third book, I think is hovering at about 301 pages uh, currently. Uh, for audible time, just based on my reading speed and what I'm comfortable with, probably looking at maybe a six to seven hours of completed work. But obviously, you're probably that completed work probably is going to be more like 25% of the actual time you'll spend. Right, right. So if you've got um, six to seven hours, then you're probably spending more like 28 to 30 hours of work time to get that completed. Is that right? I would say that's correct. Uh, it's yeah. a, and that's a mixture of just recording, you know, realizing, oh, shoot, I messed up. Let me redo it. Or I could have done that a little bit better. Or, you know, again, the great thing about recording your own audiobook, it is another level of edit. Because mm -hmm. when you're reading it, and it's not jiving, when you're reading it out loud, that's a call to action there, where it's a mm -hmm. situation where it's like, you have to fix that. Right. Because if you're dry, because it's driving you nuts reading it, recording it, then a reader is basically going to just throw your book in the trash, probably. Um, so mm -hmm. that that's kind of one of those things that will come up. Uh, mm -hmm. But also the other factor is, you know, I work with a very nice beta reader slash listener, and this person gives me a lot of valuable feedback. And sometimes they'll tell me, OK, you need to re-record this this could be better or this doesn't sound right or you went a little too quick on this particular part hmm. take a step back slow it down you know I really work work love working with them and you'll figure out their first name uh in the cover of the of the next book coming up I can promise <laughs> that yeah I had never thought about that about having beta listeners for your audiobook that's kind of an interesting idea so when you do your recording do you have a particular place that you go? Do you have a sound booth, anything like that? Um, I would say that, okay, I typically reward, uh, record in a particular room. And I find that, especially for most people, obviously I don't have like a studio. I don't have tons of soundproofing. I know a lot of people vision like professional recruiting, recording studio, you know, like the, uh, you know, getting more cowbell sketch from SNL or something along those <laughs> lines. Uh, 
Honestly, it's just basically a room that I go into. I'll close the door behind me. Uh, typically, I the best rule of thumb is usually like at least somewhere above street level, I think, if you can do it. Mm. Because you're going to rule out all those ram noises, like a car honking, like planes flying overhead, like, you know, someone's right. TV on or things that could just make you kind of bonkers when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, as far as just being, I think the idea is that you want to have an area where you control sound. I'm aware of some people who just, they'll pick a closet. They could fit in their closet and they'll record in there and that's their little booth and that's more enough. Yeah. Cool, cool. So when you are doing um, the actual audio, do you do any kind of acting or voices or do you just read it straight out? How do you do that with your books? Thank you for asking about that. was hoping <laughs> to get to that. Um, I view it at least philosophically that you should view it more as voice acting rather than recorded reading. And that's, and that's not just something, an approach that I feel works for me, but that's also someone as a listener who has tried to listen to some audio books. And it's just, it's almost as if they might as well be recording themselves reading out each of the names from uh, the yellow pages. Uh, <laughs> it was a book with people's names and addresses a long, long time ago, but uh <laughs> Uh, for those who might be a little bit younger listening in, but uh, but essentially it, it is very much voice acting. But again, your own work gives you your cues. So if you're right. saying this person screamed at someone, well, guess what you're going to be doing? If uh, if you suspect this person is angry, then do that. If they're you know excited, then feel excited. Give the listener that experience. Right. Uh, just make them feel it. Um, I don't, and that's just from a personal perspective, I admit I have some areas I need to work on in terms of how I do this. Um, I think you, I, I, I'm kind of hoping you get a little bit more leeway in terms of you being the writer that you're not a professional voice actor, so it's not quite going to be as harsh on you. Right. But, but it's definitely worth it in terms of trying to really make your voice come alive. Uh, another thing that I do, which some audio productions do, some don't, is I actually add uh, sound effects hmm. in terms of the book, in terms of certain scenarios and things that happen. Um, I use a site called Zapsplat. Uh, it's called zapsplat.com. If you read through their licensing agreement, they have a provision where you can use clips from their work in these provisions, but there's a very specific blurb that you have to use. Um, if you want, if you have a much more long-term vision that you want to make a longer-term commitment to the site, phenomenal. Like I want to say at least a quarter million sound clips they can use, high-level professional wow. stuff. If you want to use that, they have a subscription service. I stick with the blurb, but if you're interested, uh, zap s uh, z a p s p l a t dot com is the site that I will use. And I take it those are all just. I mean, assuming you you pay the subscription or, or whatever it is. Those are just sounds that are licensed to use in something like uh, this. I, they're licensed. I typically use the blurb. Um, that was just a personal decision. It's great. It's a great service. But I also think about the fact that, all right, if I wanted to sign up for a subscription, I'd want to make sure that I permanently made that connection to the company. Um, what happens if you don't? Because if you don't make that connection, and you don't have that subscription and you don't give them credit for it, you can get mm -hmm. into a heck of a lot of trouble. Right. So I felt like it was more decision to basically use the blurb that they give you in their licensing portion. And mm -hmm. that will basically smooth over any kind of like copyright issues that come up. I uh, usually put it in the metadata of each audio file that you'll upload to ACX and also put it in the product description if you look at the bottom. Right, right, because you have to be really careful about, um, you know, copyright and that sort of thing. So that's good to know. And yeah, I, I agree. I actually really like the sounds. I've um, I've never recorded my own audiobook, and it's something that I have never really wanted to do. But it feels like as I work more and as the years go by, I'm kind of leaning more toward trying it. So that's why I was actually happy to know that you did it in six days, which of course not everybody can do. You know, like you said, if they work full time, but it's very possible if you just block out. A certain amount of time that you can get it done you know um, and it's not and i would also say if you're going to try it it's not just the amount of time it could be kind of uh, i'm i'm not going to lie it could be kind of grueling 
So you have to kind of really, I want to use the term self-regulate in terms of how much you can record and kind of figure out, all right, this is the point where if I push beyond it, it's not going to be productive. And, right. you know, if someone's buying your audio book, you have to pay them that respect of giving them the 100% quality that you're going to give them, whatever that 100% for you is going to be. Right. Um, for me, it could be pretty extreme. Uh, I think when it was shorter, I mean, you're going to put in the time no matter what. There's no, mm. unlike writing where maybe you can get it done in a month, maybe you can get it done faster. With the audio book, there is no cheating. It's basically... The time that you're going to put in this is time you're going to put in basically uh yeah one of those things that kind of was uh uh something i used to be able to do was to be able to do just six hours a day of recording and it would just be non-stop just record listen edit re-record and sometimes that could happen at least a dozen times in just one chapter and mm-hmm. you're still having to keep going and having to keep kind of uh keeping everything in check but then realizing when it is you have to stop in terms of for me it's just if I keep messing up if there's just consistent mistakes and the clips because every time you stop in uh, audacity you create a clip an audio clip for your thing and every time you hit record it creates a new one if you're having lots of clips and even a short chapter or just a chapter that's not especially long that should be kind of your stop off point to say all right I'm going to finish this particular one and then I have to call it a day at that point. And just right. having that ability to just say, all right, that's my that's my fill for a day, whatever it is, maybe it might come in a two hour period. You might say, all right, maybe I could push the three, maybe four. Um, I know I've done some absolutely bonkers ones where it's been 10 hour sessions, wow. just to, over and over again, just constantly pushing. Um, I'd say that's a bit extreme, but again, if you could physically handle that and you can make sure you get plenty of water and you can basically make sure you're cool, uh, I'll think in like sort of relaxed kind of gym clothing, especially if you plan on doing a lot of shouting, um, fun little fact, if you shout loud enough, you actually break into full body sweats. So I've kind of <laughs> learned that the hard way, but, uh, you know, just that's sort awesome. of, yeah, I mean, that, that happens in terms of just some of the characters they had in a few of the books, but right. it's just sort of bouncing out holistically what works for you and just giving yourself plenty of time to kind of do it. I find the more you try to rush to get it done by a deadline, whether it's self-imposed or just this is your release deadline, that's usually where you're going to mess up. And when you push past it thinking, all right, it's not great, but I have to keep going, you're always going to find that you're going to be re-recording. Just like if you were writing, I always find that if I'm pushing through saying, all right, I just need to give a little bit more, just keep going. I usually find that after like six edits, it'll just be gone. Right. Yeah. So, okay. A couple of questions about what you said. So first of all, you, just to clarify, you do all of your own editing of the audio as well, right? Correct. Yes. Because, and yeah, I I do know something about that because, you know, I do podcasts and I don't mind the recording at all, but I really don't love the editing. <laughs> but I also know that editing, just like uh, audio narrators, can be very, very expensive to outsource. So chances mm-hmm. are, if you're doing this because, you know, if an author is doing this because they're looking for to do it uh, more affordably, you, they're not going to be able to pay for an editor either. So with right. that in mind, so it sounded like every time you make a mistake in your audio, you automatically right then stop and go back and fix it. Is that, am I understanding that right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh, just because you could push through it and you could say, oh, I'll remember. But honestly, I don't want to give myself the chance to mess up in terms of, oh, I meant to fix it, but oh, I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'll give you a perfect example of also why the beta listeners are great. Um, I'm obviously in the process of re- recording the audiobook for Anders the Blood Axe. So I submit the uh, chapters uh, to my beta listener and they're like, um, The last chapter, you kind of messed up two of the characters' names. I know you didn't Uh, realize you did it. Maybe it's just me. Why don't you go back, check it out? And then I went back, and they were 100% correct. And then basically, uh, it was a small enough mistake that I you can reuse audio that's inside Mm -hmm. what you've recorded. Um, Literally, just copy it and then paste it to where it does that. Uh, You have to be careful because you don't want that little like clipping sound where it's kind of obvious. Um, Right. 
the other thing that's kind of a bane to my to anybody's existence at recording this way, you have to watch for when you're breathing because it mm. will pick that up. And I'm sure for most people, it'd probably be fine. And obviously we have to breathe because we need oxygen. Right. But I'm sure listeners like, what is this? Is this, is this an audio book? Is this a dirty phone call? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's something that you learn to identify what your breath looks like because there's a little spectrum there, a little wave spectrum right. that shows you exactly. And you can figure out what your patterns look like and then just go through without even listening and just delete them. Mm -hmm. which makes it easier the other thing is because obviously I do in a laptop any kind of clicking noise like for instance my mouse or keyboard that also is something that I keep an ear out for and try to delete too so it's mm -hmm. just little things like that yeah for sure for sure great well so um you know is there anything else that you want specifically to tell us about the experience I mean I mean it sounds to me like since you're doing it for for several of your books that you found it to be pretty rewarding and at least worth doing again. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, look, it's definitely worth doing, especially if, you know, I, I think you have to kind of already have the inclination to be kind of someone creative in terms of, and also, you know, I know people bring up acting lessons. I think if you've already had that exposure or if you want to try it, I think you should. But mm -hmm. I certainly don't think that, you know, if you, you have to get, uh, I don't think you necessarily have to get acting licenses to kind of do that. Uh, in my case, I think I had them when I was like maybe seven or eight years old. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, but again, it's just sort of getting into character right. um, and just really getting a sense of who these are. And it makes it a deeper connection to your books. Because mm -hmm. once you're able to speak for these people, no matter who they are, uh, you put yourself in different uh, situations. Uh, and it can be kind of intense in terms of what type of styles you're writing. Um, and you know what? It's not going to be perfect, but that's okay. As long as you're giving it the best that you can give to the reader or to the listener, that should be your goal in terms of that. And just keeping that high standard for yourself. But other than that, totally worth doing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have thought of that, that it helps you uh, create a deeper bond with your own characters. That's actually really cool. That, that alone makes it sound like it's really fun and worth doing. Um, great, great. So um, tell us a little bit maybe about the, the logistics of getting it uploaded. Once you have all of your files and they're edited and they're ready to go, what do you do at that point? Okay. Um, first, if you, I'm going to assume everybody has some level of KDP account. Okay. okay. So yep. that's, let's just assume you are, there's probably a good chance of that. Um, right. Yeah. The good news is, is that yes, you'll have to create an ECX account. But the first thing you have to do is look up your book. And that's kind of also where pre-orders come in. Because mm -hmm. if you set up, if it's already published or you have a pre-order, Amazon actually talks to ACX. So you can right. search the title of your particular book. So you go in and you first, when you're setting up your account, you want to claim a book. They're going to ask, are you claiming on behalf of somebody else? Meaning, are you a voice actor professional? Or are you claiming it on behalf of yourself? If you're doing it yourself, it's you. So you have to click yourself on that one. You can type in the uh, title of your book, or if it's a very commonly titled book, if you know your ASN number, I believe is the number. Um, if you put that in, you'll be able to find your book and then claim that book. So once, you, so once you've claimed your book, they're going to give you the option to basically say, do you want the royalty structure of exclusive to just ACX? or do you want to be non-exclusive? Now you get a higher royalty. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe um, 65%, I think is the last calculation for it. Um, if you choose not to be exclusive, it's about 40 right. in terms of how that will end up working. ACX prices your book. So if you're worried about, am I going to have to price it? You know, What's the right price? That decision's already been made by ACX, depending on what your final output is going to be. Right. So, okay. So let's just say we've worked hard, we've claimed our book, we've recorded it. What do we do next? ACX will redirect you to a chapter, a little page where there are little folders with different files. Well, first it's gonna have your table of contents. It will pull from your Kindle edition if you have one. 
So mm -hmm. it'll pull that, but it will pull the main chapter name. So it'll pull chapter one, two. But if you have a location like I tend to do, um, you'll basically have to uh, get rid of that. So, okay. uh, but the good news is, is that if you use something like, because I use beta books as part of the, my uh, beta reading process, I can copy the table of contents and then paste it down into the table of contents little portion hmm. so that I get the full name, I get that. Um, there's also another little quirks that ACX has. You have to have first uh, uh, opening credits and ending credits. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that you have to think about in terms of reporting. Now your opening credits can be like your title, dedication, introduction, stuff like that. Um, Honestly, and then the end can be, you know, if, if you know there's another book, or you've already written it, or you want people to leave a good review, you would have that file at the end of it, and they have to basically be there. Um, right. Another aspect that comes up is our, what they call retail sample. So they want between a one to five minute sample of your book. So that when somebody clicks here, listen to a portion of it, this is what they're going to get. Um, and it also has to comply. So let's just say we've got our opening credits, we've got our main content, we've got our end credits. Now what? Well, the first thing that we'll do is we'll say if it's uh, opening credits, you'll click browse. You'll find your file. The file will then upload. Uh, depending on, it takes longer depending on how long your file is, um, but you could expect to be spending at least an hour kind of uploading things. When the okay. file uploads it will automatically run through the ACX audio requirement test. So you'll see hmm. it start to load, start to turn, start to turn. And then one of two things is gonna happen. One, it passes, in which case it shows exactly how long the file is, it shows exactly how big it is and shows the file name for it, okay? And then you're successful. However, the alternative is if you didn't pass the test and then what it does is it gives you a message to tell you to go look at the audio manager. And then when you click the audio manager tab, it will give you the specific message of why you did not pass this particular mm -hmm. time. Bear in mind, it, ACX does not forgive that kind of stuff. It, it will just refuse it. So okay. if, if you're hoping it'll skip it, you have to re-record it and then re-upload it and then it'll be fine. Um, you can also replace it anytime, by the way. It's not like once it's in, it's in when you're in the production process. So for instance, you know, in my case, all right, there was an audio file recorded, but I made changes to it. So you can just go to the little right actions tab, click replace, and then just replace that up. It'll run the same tests. When you have all these files ready to go, then what you're going to do is you're going to submit to ACX. And depending on how long it takes them, um, in my, I would say give yourself three weeks before release if you're going to do that. Um, the first book, it only took two, but the last one I did two weeks before, and there was kind of a week delay between when the Kindle paperback edition were released and the uh, ACX. So, so that's just time for them to approve all of it and get it all squared away on their back end, right? Yep, absolutely. They're going to listen to every bit of it. They're going to make sure you're not breaking any of their content rules or anything like that. Right. Um, but honestly, if you're passing the ACX test, that's going to be a quick process. Okay. So I mean, um, just to kind of clarify on that, um, it, have you had a lot of files that you, that they, they passed the ACX test when you did it on Audacity, but then did they still not pass when you uploaded them? Or usually if they pass on yours, do they pass when you upload them? They pass when they pass, definitely. Okay. Um, the only Good. thing that can kind of be a bit of a headache, um, there was an instance <clears throat> in one of my books where there's certain sound effects that the standard will not have pass just because uh -huh. of their loudness. So I went back and did another round of audio editing, basically. So I opened up a new project in Audacity, pulled the new file in, started doing some editing and things of that nature. And in the end, because I dropped the volume so low, it's a little short sometimes. Mm. So basically you'll hear it's a little low and that does happen. But generally speaking, if you can get it to pass, it'll pass. Gotcha, gotcha. And if you, so if it doesn't pass, 
Do yeah. you have to completely re-record that or is there a way to go in and like take out the sound or mess with it and, or, you know, take out more background noise? Is it possible to do that with Audacity? Um, not in Audacity, yes. You can re-record, you can edit, you can delete things if you want to. Um, okay. and, and the only reason I'm vague is just because it depends on really what kind of what isn't passing if right. there's a peak i mean for me when i'm recording the voice on this i generally only have to do the rms normalization under effects and then do the limiter and that typically will get it to pass nine times out of ten okay um the funny thing is though you could play with it in audacity so as long as it's short it's okay if it doesn't pass it's when it becomes a sizable portion of your audio file that's when you're going to get into trouble in terms of that stuff gotcha. but it, the thing that would make you re-record is if the background noise is either mm -hmm. too high um which i found is a pain in the butt to try to drop that basically okay. uh, i'm not exactly an expert i know there are people on youtube who basically could do it and it's right. child's play for them it's easier for you to raise noise floors because they're too quiet um or as opposed to trying to drop them. Okay. Uh, in which case, if it's too high, then yes, I usually will end up re-recording something like that. Yeah. So do you just do all of your editing inside Audacity or do you have another program that you edit with? Uh, I do it all inside of Audacity. Inside Audacity. Uh, honestly, uh, it, Audacity gives you everything you need and like a thousand percent right. more. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess, um, Probably what I would say to anyone listening is before they do it, maybe do an Audacity tutorial or um, if, if they're not familiar already. And I, I've done that before, too. I've just looked up how to do X, Y and Z on Audacity, how to um, you know fix this. And there's tons and tons of tutorials about how to do it. So it's really not yeah, that difficult once you've done it once or twice. You just have to learn the software, especially for Audacity for audiobooks. That is definitely a big topic on YouTube. It's a lot of great information. The only drawback is it's kind of spread out. So it's spread out to YouTube, it's spread off to different articles and various places. And you're gonna be doing a lot of research when you're figuring out what exactly your style is in terms of, you know, is it just too loud in my apartment? Is it, am I too quiet? Right. Uh, you know, uh, why is this happening over and over again? You know, I mean, Sometimes the microphones are sensitive up where it's like, okay, there's an uh, air conditioner on the other side of the house that's screwing up the background levels. So I mean, right. it's just stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So probably the first time I imagine that you do it, it's probably going to be a lot harder, just like writing a book, you know, you're learning it the first time and you're having to learn every little thing about every little thing. And then once you've done it once, you kind of have a better idea of what it's going to take and how hard it's going to be. Uh, I would say that the writing is easier. That's what I'll say on that. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, in terms of just, I mean, let's face it, you could get away with doing 10 hour day writing sessions. God knows I used to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But with the audio, because you're projecting your voice right. and you're using that and you're really, if, especially if you're really committing to it, you're going to be, you're, you're going to basically uh, feel it at that point. But depending on your fitness, that might not be a big deal. Uh, but and it will feel like a grind when you're doing it. But when you hear that product, it does make it worth it. Yeah, for sure. Great. Well, thank you so much. This is a lot of really valuable information for anyone who might be considering doing this. Um, where can my listeners connect with you and your books? Um, I'm on WordPress. If you go to Andrew J. O'Brien author wordpress.com, that's kind okay. of my main staging area where I like to sort of give a uh, background process and just sort of keep up to date what my projects are. Um, I also recently just started uh, going on a TikTok. You can find me at K's and Kilo, C's and Charlie. One is in uh, the number, M is in Mike, I is in India and J is in Juliet. Uh, so KC, one M-I-J. And that's my uh, amateur radio call sign. Ah, nice. That's super cool. All right, well, I will make sure and link all that up in the show notes so people can find you. And just, yeah, again, thank you for all the information. I really appreciate it. And good luck with all of your endeavors. You as well. It's definitely been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, no problem.